All right. Uh, good morning. Welcome to the session on exploring coroutines in Kotlin. My name is Venkat Subramaniam. I'm going to talk about uh, what's really exciting about coroutines, why should we consider using it, uh, what are some of the problems it solves. So that's what we're going to focus on. But before we do that, I want to kind of step back and talk about where we have been, uh, especially in the, in the world of uh, Java and JVM, and then why we should really consider maybe doing something very different. Uh, in fact, what's really exciting is uh, languages like Kotlin are maybe, I would say, uh, five to six years, if not a decade earlier than where Java will be in terms of some of these things that will become available eventually in Java. But one of the things that we've been doing a lot in uh, Java in general is uh, parallelism. And, and I came from a background of uh, C++, Java, C Sharp, and languages like that. And, and pretty much, uh, I spent most of my life in sequential versus parallel computing. And when I started programming in Node, I found it really hard in the beginning because I had to really think asynchronously rather than thinking in sequential versus parallel. And that, that was a huge paradigm shift for me in my mind. But as I went through that, I realized that this is where the real power is. When it comes to scale, uh, while parallel is exciting, I think we should really start rethinking the way we do things. And asynchrony seems to be making a lot more sense. This is especially true in the world of microservices and such that we live in today. This becomes very, very critical. So let's talk a little bit about where does this really take us. Well, when it comes to uh, you know, languages like Java, we've been focusing on concurrency. But rather than saying, I want to run things in parallel, what if we think along the lines of non-blocking? So I want to make a call, but I don't want to wait and wait for that call to finish. I want to just fire and forget and move on. And when that call is finished, maybe some process can execute right after that. So rather than uh, concurrency and parallelism, what if we start thinking in terms of non-blocking calls? But before we uh, explore that, let's think about uh, you know, what is the similarity and why this is really exciting. And I'm, I'm really beginning to rethink about some of the, uh, you know, paradigms that we are exposed to. And so let's step back just a little bit to Java and, and spend a, just a couple of minutes looking at something that Java really nicely provides and then, and then see where we want to go very differently. Now, if you really think about, uh, you know, the, the world of Java for a minute, uh, what did we have in the past? Well, we had imperative style of programming in the past. But with the imperative style of programming, it's incredibly difficult uh, to program concurrency. So if you have written a sequential code using a traditional for loop, for example, and if somebody comes to you and says, make this code parallel, you will find the nearest exit, because it's really hard to parallelize a code which is written imperatively. But on the other hand, if you were to take, a, let's say, a list of numbers, if you will, again, just, just a few minutes on Java here, I can say numbers.stream. And then I can perform a map operation, for example, map to int. And given an element, we could transform the element, if you will. And then, of course, once I do this, I'll reduce this. And in this case, we'll just say reduce it using a sum method. So that's a pretty simple operation. But if I were to run this sequentially, it would take as much time as <coughs> the transform method is going to take. <coughs> Excuse me. So what does the transform method do? It's going to do some kind of computation. We don't care about what it's actually doing. But let's say, let's keep it extremely trivial here. This is going to simply return the value, let's say, n after all. But I could introduce a little sleep function right here. Let's say this is going to, you know, to pretend that it's going to take some time to compute. And if I were to provide a sleep function, what, what would it take for this code to execute? Well, that's going to take about uh, 10 seconds for this code to execute, after all, because it's going to have to loop through every single element and do it. And you can see the beach ball running right there. But what if I want to parallelize this code? That's one of the nice things about the streams API here, is it makes it really easy to parallelize it. So I can simply say parallel, and then, of course, uh, we can just run this code. And as you know, it doesn't take that 10 seconds anymore. That was quite uh, fast. So what did we learn from that little exercise or from that experience? And I would say one of the things we learned about it is that we can definitely relate to this very nicely. So that the structure of, I'm going to say, functional sequential code is the same as that of the parallel code. And this is a huge benefit if you really think about it. So this is really what we got from parallel streams. And one of the really things about parallel streams is the structure of functional style sequential code is the same as the structure of functional style parallel code. But this is a huge benefit because in the past, 
the code structure was so different between sequential and parallel, it was really hard to maintain that code. I want to take this forward and see what coroutines really give us, and, and, and maybe we can relate to that similarity in just a few minutes. So let's step back and talk about, you know, why not be happy with just using parallel? Well, it turns out that functional style is really awesome, no doubt about it. I, I love functional programming. I like the way it works. But there are times when maybe that's not the right choice or not for everything we do. One of the things that really bothers me with functional style, though, is how does it really handle exceptions? It is incredibly messy when it comes to dealing with exceptions in functional style. Part of the reason for that is the functional style of programming and exception handling are actually mutually exclusive. It doesn't really make sense to throw exceptions in the code when you're dealing with functional style. Well, functional style is really beautiful when you're dealing with pure functions. But what if the functions are not pure? What if you're doing I.O., which is the reality when you call a web service, for example? And, and what if those calls are going to fail as typically it would when you talk to a web service or update a file or do other database operations? So this is where coroutines can come in really handy. So one of the things about coroutines are that coroutines are inherently asynchronous. Let's explore this a little bit to see what this really means in the context of coroutines. So I'm going to start here with a little bit about Kotlin right here. So let's go ahead and create a process function. It is taking an integer. I'm going to keep it extremely simple and trivial here. And in this case, all I'm going to do is simply return the value uh, given to me. So when I, when I go to this process, I'm going to just return the value. And I want to call this particular method. So I'm going to print line and call the process method. Oh, let's send a value of 2. Uh, rather, a very simple example. The process is simply returning what's given to it. But obviously, in this case, we can ask for the thread information. So I can say thread dot current thread. And, and the current thread of execution that's executing this code is going to be, of course, no surprise here, it's going to be the main thread. So that's Kotlin reporting that we're return, running a main thread. And then, of course, the process is returning it. But what, in the, uh, what thread is the process really running? So we could say process, and then we could ask for the uh, thread information within that, of course. And in this case, we can immediately relate to and say, of course, that's going to run in the main thread as well. And so as a result, you can see that both of them are running in the main thread. But what if I want to really run things in a different thread, uh, run it asynchronously? In other words, I don't want to block, I don't want to wait for a process to be completed. Well, in that case, what I could do here is we could launch, for example. So I could say uh, launch that particular uh, process, and I could ask it to run uh, asynchronously. And we'll talk more about this as we go along. So I'm just calling a method called launch and say, go ahead and fire that off and, and let that run. And I'm going to just put a little sleep here just to uh, keep that alive, if you will. And we'll say sleep for about you know, two seconds. So we can fire that off and say, go execute this on you know, asynchronously and, and come back and report me the result. So how does this really uh, work? So uh, we can go ahead and import the launch method that I'm going to use right in here. So go ahead and fire that off and see what it's going to do. And of course, it uh, you know, requires that I spell this properly. So let's try this. And uh, then, of course, when I run this in here, you can see that it is going to report to us that that's running off in a completely different thread. So it's not really that hard to launch things and let them you know, go off and run on a different thread automatically. So you can see the main is still running in the main thread. But when we call the launch, the process is running in a completely different thread. So we could set off to run things uh, asynchronously. But where does this really take us? Well, we can go from uh, synchronous execution to asynchronous execution. So in other words, what we are saying is, rather than having to execute something in the current thread and waiting on the process to finish, we could just fire off that process and have that execute. And then as that executes, we can go back and do other things. Uh, when would you want to really do this? So one of the places where this becomes at least very critical is, Imagine you are in a UI thread. Well, it could be a Swing application or it could be an Android application. It really doesn't matter. And we know that when you're in a UI-based application, 
in the UI thread, you don't want to do anything that blocks. Because if you block in the UI thread, the application becomes completely non-responsive. And when the application becomes non-responsive, it, it really results in a very poor user experience. And the user is going to leave uh, in, in today's world where we are using devices. We need immediate response. Responsiveness is, responsiveness is extremely important. So what do we do? We can instead say, well, when I'm performing an operation on the UI thread, I don't want to block and wait the UI thread for this. Let's just go ahead and you know, make that call and continue processing other UI events. Well, but what you want to do is to make this programming really easy, because if it becomes really hard, then it becomes expensive to write this code and to maintain it as well. So in other words, you want asynchrony to be as seamless as possibly you can get to. So this is where you want to go from synchronous call to asynchronous call. But also on the same note, from blocking to non-blocking calls, that's what we really are interested. So how does core routines actually work? What do they really provide for us? So one of the things to really consider when it comes to core routines is, so what does it really mean to say it's a core routine? Uh, core routines have been around in programming languages for a very long time. Uh, Kotlin is not the first language to do it, definitely. But Kotlin has a very, what I like to call as hygienic syntax. So it becomes really easy to engage that in the code and to be able to process that. So let's think about a little example to see how core routines actually work. So to understand this, you're going to write a method. And, and usually, when you are writing methods, you can mark a method as a method that would be suspending the call. And then it can go off and execute potentially in a different thread, but more important, asynchronously. Well, we cannot talk about coroutines without talking about continuations. So under the hood, it really is continuations that play a very important role. So what is really a continuation? So this is a concept that has been around again for a long time. We're not quite exposed to this in the JVM uh, languages, unfortunately. But that's going to change in the future. But coroutines basically rely upon continuations. So imagine you are making a call to a web server right now. How does the traditional Java web server work? You make a call and say, I want to process this request. And then you establish who you are, and then the response comes back. And then when you want to maybe click on a link and send more data, you reestablish your credentials. And you say, hey, here I am. Can I engage in a conversation? And, and this is the way we unfortunately implement the, the web services. Uh, on the other hand, imagine how you and I communicate. <coughs> Excuse me, maybe you and I met yesterday. We talked about something. And this morning, we can just hit off the conversation and start from where we left. We don't have to reestablish the context because we remember the context. That's exactly where continuations come in. So imagine you make a call to a function. But when you return from the function, what if you can return not just the result of the function, but a context of where you returned from? When that caller wants to continue back with you, they can call back into that context and continue. Let's take a look at how this is going to look like with a little example where we can just kind of entertain this thought and see how this would work. So to understand this, let's go ahead and talk about one example of a sequence. This is a wrapper API provided in Kotlin. So I'm going to say sequence is equal to, and I'm going to say begin sequence over here. And, and let's go ahead and just start with a little sequence of call. And, and within here, I'm going to simply yield. Let's start with baby steps. I'm going to yield one. And I'm going to say in here, value in will just say sequence right now. And I'm going to simply print out this particular value that I've received on my hand. And I'm just going to start with this little example to you know, just play with this and see how it, it's going to progress right now. So, so what we are doing here is to just start with a little uh, you know, lazy evaluation. But what this object is going to do for us really is, uh, is it's going to give us an ability to walk through the code and be able to uh, you know, uh, uh, engage in a, a context of evaluation. But the beautiful thing about core routines is that you can continue from where you left, uh, left off uh, very easily, if you will. I'm going to just pull in a little code here and play with this. I'm blanking out. So give me a second. So all you're doing is you're just engaging in this conversation and uh, pulling this data and moving forward. So let's see how this is going to work with in just a little example here, just to see how this is going to uh, play out. So what I'm going to do here is, of course, a build sequence. Uh, sorry. So, uh, so I'm going to just build the sequence and continue 
deal with this conversation. So what does this do? Well, this is a little trivial. It said uh, yield one, but let's go ahead and say over here, we'll just say one for a minute. And of course, you know you're entering this method. It says a one. But the real nice thing about this is, this is something you see in other languages like JavaScript as well. So I'm going to say two over here, and I'm going to yield a value of two. And maybe just a couple of more, we'll say three here, and yield a value of three. But the beauty of this conversation is, and then I'm going to first finally say, for example here, let's go ahead and say done for a minute. So when you look at this particular code, you can see that you come into the sequence right now. But I'm, I'm going to say here, uh, well, the value is, let's say, uh, and then we'll just print the value we receive. But when you execute this particular sequence of calls, notice the, the format of the call and how it goes back and forth between the code. So we entered into the sequence. We printed the one on the top, line number four. And then we say the value is one, which is from line number 17. But notice that when we are looping through, we step back right into line number six and execute. And then we leave off at line number eight. But then when we go back, we go into line number nine and execute it. So this is really where you are jumping into the middle of a function, executing a part of it, and then you're jumping back into the middle of the function and executing part of it. So in other, in other words, you're not entering into the top of the method every single time. You are leaving off here. When you come back, you do this part. And then when you come back, you do this part. And then eventually, you finish this part and go away. It's intriguing to think about how in the world this could possibly work. And, and the way this actually works is when you are leaving off with the yield, like I mentioned earlier, you're not only returning this result, but you are taking the remaining part of the code and, and moving it as what is the continuation. So think of this as a lambda, if you will. So you're returning two parts to the caller. One is the result of the call, but the other is a lambda. So the caller can use the result and then fire back right into the lambda. And then you continue executing here, and then this part again becomes the next continuation you return. And then, of course, when you return this, this part becomes the following continuation. And then when you are done with this, of course, there is nothing to continue at the very end. So continuations play a really vital role when it comes to using coroutines. And you can dissect the code and see how this is working internally. But to understand this, let's try to do something a little different and see how we can put this into a bit of a practical context. So to understand this, let's go over here to a little example and play with it. So the first thing here is, I'm going to go to the uh, command prompt here for a second. And I'm going to open a little service I have on a local host, uh, 8085. Hopefully that's running, but I'll verify that. And I'm going to ask for the ticker Google. And this service I'm running locally on this machine is just going to report to me the price of a stock symbol when I ask for it. So that's a price for uh, Google that it reports. So it seems like that service that I'm running locally is running. But let's go ahead and see how I can make use of that service here in my code and, and see why this is a little bit of a better approach than maybe using uh, other approaches. So to understand this, let's go back here to a little example. Let's start with, a, we'll take baby steps. Let's take a function right now. We'll call it as get stock price. And, and the stock price is going to take a ticker. Let's go ahead and call that as a string. And what I want to do is simply return a string. I'll just keep it extremely simple here. So I'm going to just return back a string. Uh, what do I want to return from here? We'll say java.util.url. Uh, and in this case, uh, well, net.url. And in this case, what we will do is simply provide the HTTP localhost. And this is going to be 8085 is the port I'm running in. A ticker is equal to and the given ticker. So we'll just provide the uh, ticker symbol for it to fire off the request. But one of the nice things we can do here is we can then say uh, on this one, we can ask for the uh, uh, text. So we could simply say, this is going to return to me uh, a text, basically. I can ask for a text value to be returned from this. Once I get the text value from this call, what do I want to do? Uh, I want to obviously print that result so we can say, get stock price. And we could ask for the ticker symbol. Let's just start with Google as the ticker symbol I want to start with. So all we are going to ask for this is to simply say, hey, run this little code for me. Uh, give me back a result uh, when, I'm, when, I, when it's done. But this is going to be a very uh, regular sequential call, as you would expect. Nothing really exciting about it. 
But I want to turn this into an asynchronous call. Uh, how do we really do that? That's the question. So for that, what I'm going to do here is uh, we are going to uh, ask it to uh, provide the value. So I'm going to simply say over here, uh, execute this code. And when you're done with this, simply give me a, a read text from it and return a text value from the response, whatever the price is that I'm going to return back from this call. Uh, but this is a sequential call, as we know. But then what I want to do is, what if potentially things were to go wrong, we typically need to deal with exceptions as well. So let's take this a little further. Keep that away. We'll come back to this. I have another function. I'll call it as IP address. So let's call it as get caller IP, for lack of better words. And, and what this method is going to do is to return to us. Similarly, we'll say return java.net.url. And, and what I'm going to do here is ask for, again, we'll do a read text on it. But I'll ask for um, uh, a URL to tell me what IP address I'm making the call from. That's going to make a request to a remote server, obviously, in this case. And I'm going to just try that out real quick to see if that's working. So caller IP will just go ahead and run that call. And, and hopefully, that uh, comes back eventually and tells us that's my IP address. OK, fair enough. But what I want to do is to take a problem a little bit further. And I want to say, uh, you know, get the stock price. Uh, and uh, if successful, uh, get the IP. So this kind of poses a little bit of a problem here. It's possible that it did not succeed. Why wouldn't it succeed? For a number of reasons. I may not have connection to the service. I may have an invalid ticker symbol. A lot of things can uh, fall apart. So in other words, we have to start dealing with exceptions. So I'll go ahead and try this this way. So we'll say try. And we will say value price is equal to get stock price for Google, we'll actually say ticker right here. And we will start with a little ticker. So ticker is equal to Google. And, and then, of course, I'm going to say, give me the price. But what if that did not work? So I'll say catch exception. And in this case, we'll say exception. And, and then we will you know, maybe report the exception. So we'll simply say, uh, you know, uh, error uh, getting a price, let's say getting price uh, for maybe ticker. So that's a very first step. And if it works through, we'll get the price. Otherwise, we'll report that we, we got into an error. But what if we were able to get the price? If we got the price, then I want to say over here, try. And we will say IP is equal to get, let's say, caller IP. And then I can print out, we can say price for a ticker is. And I'm going to report the price, which is going to be the price. Uh, and then we could say uh, you know, request from. And then we would report the IP. But what if things don't go as planned? We could say catch exception. And this is going to become an exception again. And in this case, of course, what I want to do is to simply report back saying print, uh, let's say, error uh, getting uh, IP. So um, if you notice this, this is a traditional imperative style code. But what is more important to keep in mind is the multiple exceptions and multiple levels of exception we have to deal with. If the stock price fails, we don't want to get the IP. If the stock price succeeds, but if the IP fails, we want to report that too. And if both of them succeeded, we want to report the price and the ticker. This is obviously a sequential uh, code, but it is uh, going and calling two different services to make this call. And of course, the response eventually comes back with whatever that price was. The question is, how do we turn this into an asynchronous call? How do we make this non-blocking so we don't have to just block and wait on each one of these calls? Well, that's the part we're going to look at next. So to see how this is going to work, first of all, let's go ahead and do something a little different. Let's go ahead and call a launch right here. And, and this launch is going to fire off that request so that the UI thread or whatever the main thread doesn't have to block and wait on this. So typically, in a UI application, you don't have to do this because the application is alive and running. It's going to be processing the request from the request thread. Whereas this is just a simple main program I'm running, this is not going to wait for us to finish. So I'm going to put a little thread.sleep on this just to keep it afloat, let's say, for a little bit. So, so this is going to launch off the request, and that's going to run in a completely different thread. And just to illustrate this point, we'll just go ahead and print out here a request, let's say, sent. So, so when I run this code, the request is going to be sent off. And then, of course, that call is going to happen. And then it's going to come back with the response. 
But when you look at the code within the launch itself, what's going to happen here is, of course, I need to bring in the uh, reference to the uh, import. And, and in this case, of course, when within the launch, when we are making the call, the call is going to get blocked and wait on that within that thread. But what if I really want to relieve that? So this is where the real fun is. If you go back to this, you can say uh, suspend, and you can specify a little suspend on it. So what does the suspend do? This is where I, I, I want to say this is a very hygienic way of doing things. There is, it's almost seamless, but I don't want things to become so seamless that you don't know what's happening. So the suspend over here gives you a clue that when you make a call to this function, you're going to pretty much take this call, and you're going to roll the rest of the code into a continuation and say, you go off and execute this, this code. When the result comes back, execute the rest of the code that's below this. So this is a completely transform code thanks to this suspend. Similarly, I can come in here and say suspend over here. And as a result, this call becomes a, a, a non-blocking call, but the rest of the things are going to be executed in the context of a coroutine. Now, let's go ahead and run this first, and then we'll come back and see how this actually uh, is different in just a few minutes. <coughs> so when I run this code, of course, it's going to go off and get the request. We don't see much difference at all, but what is the real difference? To understand the real difference, let's try something else a little differently. Um, you can try to run and see the threads of execution and all that, but usually that's really hard to predict. But let's look at this from a slightly different uh, point of view. Let's just grab this function real quick. Let's analyze and take a look at something a little different. So here on the command prompt, I'm going to try a few things. Don't have anything here in this directory right now. We'll just go ahead and create a little uh, you know, Kotlin file right now. And, and I'm going to say over here, let's actually put this into a class for a minute. So let's say class, let's call this a sample. And within the sample class, I want to go ahead and copy those two functions. Just for a minute, let's try this. So let's go ahead and say Kotlin uh, C and compile the, uh, this particular, uh, you know, uh, let's try this again, Kotlin C and compile this code real quick. Um, OK, so <laughs> it's Kotlin. All right, so why is that not in the path? OK, let's try this again. So um, all right, so that's be better. Uh, it looks like I changed the path. Don't do anything before the demo. OK, try this again. So, uh, so let's try this Kotlin, uh, Kotlin uh, C and then compile this code again. Really? OK, so let's try this one more time. All right, there we go. Uh, so, so this time, of course, I'm going to compile this one more time. And, and this produces the byte code. I want to say Java P, and I've already configured Java P to give me a, a minus C option. Let's take a look at the class file real quick. What I really want to focus on right now is just this part for you. So just look at this one liner for a minute. So it's very obvious what we are seeing here. Get stock price is the function. We have a string value coming in. <coughs> it's returning a string. Uh, I took so much effort and so many errors to prove the obvious to you that the get stock price is a function that takes a string, returns a string. No big deal, right? OK. Let's try something a little different. Let's go back to this uh, you know, function uh, class one more time. But I'm going to say suspend over here. And I'm going to mark this one as a suspend also. So with doing this, what did we achieve at this point? By making those two as suspend, let's go ahead and run Kotlin C one more time. Let's uh, go ahead and run a Java P one more time. But this time, the result is pretty significant. If you notice this time, though, uh, good news, stock price is still taking a string. However, notice that it has actually a second argument in the code. This is what I was talking about earlier as being extremely hygienic. If you notice, this function is no longer returning a string. The function is taking not one argument, but two arguments, the first argument being a string and the second one being a continuation that it is actually taking. I was earlier saying this whole thing is based on continuations. And this is one of the reasons to really see how this is actually working behind the scenes is that the get price method, in fact, what's really interesting about this is, notice you didn't call this any differently. But what the compiler does for you is internally, when it makes the call, it passes the continuation as a second argument 
without you having to do this. So, so the compiler does a lot of work for you in this case where it recognizes that the function is a, is, is, a, uh, is a suspend function. So to know that this is a suspend, it is going to then pass the continuation as a second argument, and all that is done for you automatically for you behind the scenes. And as a result, you can see in this case that when you make this call, you are going to take the rest of the code and wrap it as a continuation and then pass it on to here for execution. So that is an example of how that, that call can execute uh, in, a, in a thread independent of this, so you don't have to block and wait on it. So going back to this example, what, what's happening at this point is, this is launching a separate thread of execution, so this becomes non-blocking. And imagine you are in a UI thread, you can just you know, fire off and say, go do this for me, I don't want to wait on this execution to finish. When you come into this execution in the same way, when you come in here, your thread of execution sends off a request because we marked it as suspend, this says, I don't want to wait for this to execute and finish, and go ahead and fire this off. And when you are done executing, at that point, continue evaluating the rest of the code that's wrapped around as a continuation. Now, why is this pretty exciting? Part of the reason this is exciting for me is, notice how the code is going to look like right now in this particular context. If you look at the code we had a minute ago, what did we have? Well, first of all, we didn't have the launch, so we didn't have a suspend, and we didn't have this suspend right in here, but then we did not have this launch over here, and, and neither did we have this part. But rest of the code is pretty much the same that you saw here, if you will. So when I run this code, this is the sequential code without any suspend, without any continuations, and you can see the code is producing the result. But notice the changes I'm going to make right now. I'm going to say this is suspend right here. And similarly, I'm going to mark this as a suspend right here. So that's the two changes we made. The next change we made here is to say launch over here. And, and of course, we are setting it off to run in a separate thread at this point. And then we closed it off right here. But if you really notice, the code structure was pretty much intact, which is, which is what I want to really drive towards. So notice how the structure of functional sequential code is the same as the structure of uh, you know, parallel code. With coroutines, what we get really on our hand is that the structure of imperative style synchronous code is the same as the structure of asynchronous uh, code as well. So this is a huge benefit we get because if the code structure is extremely different, then it becomes an impedance mismatch. We have to spend way too much effort trying to maintain the code. You write the code sequentially, you got it working, you debugged it, it's easy to understand, it's easier to work with, then you realize you want to make it asynchronous. You don't have to go and change the code structure and turn it into a monster. You can pretty much keep the same code structure and move forward. And this is one of the biggest benefits you get out of this is the, the, the structure of the synchronous code is the same as the structure of asynchronous code when it comes to core routines. And, and that is a huge benefit. Now, of course, the reason we do this is for responsiveness, I mentioned earlier. So you're able to get a better responsiveness because you're saying, I want this code to you know, just give me the ability to respond to events while that goes off and executes it. But what if I really want to get a performance out of this? How do I really do that? Well, you can also run the code asynchronously as well. So to understand this, let's take a slightly different example here. Let's get rid of the, these, these values. Let's say for a minute, I'm going to write another function. And, and this function is going to be called measure, let's say measure time. So this is going to just tell me how much time I'm taking to do some work. So I'm going to say block. And in this case, we will say this doesn't return anything for us. I'll say start is equal to system.nanotime. And uh, then let's go ahead and say uh, end is equal to system.nanotime. And, and what I want to do here is to call the block of code right in between so we can measure the time it takes. And we'll just print out right here, how about this, n minus the start, 1 point, uh, let's say, OE9. And then we want to say that's how many seconds we are taking to execute this. So we'll simply say seconds. So, so that's going to tell us how many seconds we are taking to run this little piece of code. And, and of course, uh, that's really uh, what we want to use. We got to do a few things to make this asynchronous, but we'll come back and worry about this a little bit later. So, so now that we have this code, what do I want to do? 
I want to say tickers is equal to list of. Let's go ahead and create a few of them. Let's say we have Google. Uh, we have a few other things uh, uh, in, in listed here. So I want to go back and get prices for all these different stocks. H how much time is it going to take? Uh, what is the performance I'm going to get out of this? So measure time. And in this case, we will go ahead and say for. And let's make it actually very imperative and traditional, if you will. So let's go ahead and say this is going to be prices is equal to a mutable list uh, of string. And I want to just create a mutable list of string values. Let's say that's all I'm going to create right now. And we'll just go ahead and print out the prices. We'll take baby steps and get to this and, and see how this is going to work in just a minute. So that's taking about you know, four seconds, uh, well, four, four point minus four seconds. Obviously, we're not doing any work. Shouldn't take much time. But what do I want to do? I'm going to say price. Uh, in this case, we'll go ahead and say ticker, for, uh, let's rather price. So ticker in tickers. And I want to get the price for each of the tickers. So price is plus equal to, and I want to say over here, uh, get stock price for the given ticker. Once I get all the prices, we'll then say for price in prices. And then I'm going to simply loop through this and print out what do I want to say in here. I want to just print out the price we got back. Right? That's, again, a very traditional uh, for loop uh, for getting the work done. So, so let's go ahead and remove the suspend for a minute. We'll come back to that later. So, so execute it. As you can see, it didn't like me putting the suspend. We'll come back to that a little bit later. So when we run this code, you can see that that's going to produce the result for us. This is price, not prices. So we can see it's, well, actually, let's do this a little differently. Let's go back to this code and say, uh, in here, uh, after it finishes, let's go ahead and say this is going to become a uh, price for ticker uh, is, and then we'll just print out the price for it. There we go. So, so that should tell us the price for each of the tickers that we get back. Well, OK, so this is sequential. We know this. And how much time uh, is it going to take to execute? Well, it's going to take uh, you know, as many seconds as it wants. Uh, if each of them take about a second, that's going to be a little bit more than three seconds of execution. And, and let's see if that actually reports it back to us. So there you go. It's about three seconds. How do I make this uh, asynchronous? How do I make this you know, maybe run asynchronously but get the results back at the same time? So one of the things you could actually do is, obviously, uh, I want to run this um, asynchronously. I don't want my thread to block on this. So we could, again, say thread.sleep to just keep it waiting uh, in the, because it's a main function. We'll go ahead and do a launch on this one. So we'll say launch. And once we launch this, we'll measure the time after we launch this as well. Right now, you're not going to see many, uh, much performance difference, but we'll take baby steps to get towards it. So when I run this code, that thread is going to put it off. The main is going to finish and wait. But in this case, that other thread is going to still do it sequentially. And no, no surprise there, it still took three seconds. But what I can do, though, is I can come back to this code and say, I can do async on this. And when I do async on it, I'm saying, Go ahead and evaluate this part uh, asynchronously for me. When I do this asynchronously, what is this going to return? It is going to return a deferred object. So this is going to say, I'm going to run the execution, but I'll come back to you with the result later on. So that becomes a deferred string in this, in this particular example. So, so I'm going to take this as a deferred string. And, and I'm not going to change this right now. We'll change it eventually. So when I run this, you're not going to get the results you want. But nevertheless, it illustrates the point. So when you look at the output, you notice that all these prices are actually going to be the deferred uh, coroutine values. So, but notice the time it took. The t time it took is a lot less. That's because it didn't wait for the results to come. So that's why it's that low. Not a very fair comparison. But what I want to do here is I want to await for the result. So in this case, you can say, uh, I want to go ahead and execute this object, this, this particular coroutine. But when I finish it, I want to wait for the results to come back. So you have launched off a bunch of requests on the side. And then you are saying, when the results come back, wait for them and report them. Um, this code won't work right now. We'll see why in just a few minutes. One of the best ways to do that is to just try to run it and see what error it gives us. When I, when I run this, it says suspension function can only be used within a coroutine body. Well, clearly that says you can't really call a wait over here. And the reason is 
you are not in a, in a function, in a core routine that will allow you to suspend. And you may look at this and say, gosh, what does that me me uh, mean? Because I'm after all in launch, and that's a core routine block of code, isn't it? Well, it turns out that the real block of code we are in is this lambda right here. But that lambda is not a core routine. And because this lambda is not a core routine, a suspend function, it doesn't want you to do that. So no, notice what I'm going to do here. I'm going to make this a suspend uh, because I don't want to uh, you know, do that in the, in the main thread and block on it. But then I'm going to also mark this lambda parameter as a suspend as well. So then it tells us that this particular lambda itself can run in a suspend mode, so you can just go off and you know, don't have to block and wait on it. So we mark those two as suspend. We didn't care to make this one as suspend. We could if you want to, but in this case, we don't really have to because we use the asynchronous over here. So when I run this code this time around, uh, what, what it gave us is the following. When you run this code, it gives us the results we are expecting, but also notice it only took about one second and not three seconds. Uh, where are we going with this? Where we are going with this is, let me, let me do this this way. Let me just go ahead and copy that. Let's go, go blow away everything. We'll just go ahead and say code two for a minute. And uh, code two is the, is the synchronous, uh, sorry, the asynchronous version we wrote. Uh, let me fall back on the code we wrote a few minutes ago and just fall back to the synchronous version that we had a minute ago. So back up to here, I think that's good enough. Let's go ahead and run this code real quick. And uh, this takes about three seconds of execution uh, for it to uh, work on. So um, yeah, there we go. Let's go ahead and copy that as a code uh, one for a minute. So this is the code without synchrony. So let's go ahead and just take a look at the difference between these two code just to see what, what difference we are seeing here. Well, if you notice over here, uh, the differences we see are the following. Let me see if I can zoom into this a little bit. So you notice. The first difference here is we put the suspend on this side, and there was no suspend on this one. That's the difference. The second difference is just the type over here. The third difference is the async over here versus no async on this side. And then, of course, we call await on this one with no await on this side. Well, essentially, here is the difference between this, the sequential version and the asynchronous version, right? The synchronous, rather, and the asynchronous. And this goes back to the point I made earlier in that the structure of the synchronous code is the same as the structure of asynchronous code, and you're able to keep them very consistent. And, and what I really like about this is uh, it is almost seamless. And I really want the uh, word almost is important in my opinion. If it is way too seamless, where you don't see the difference at all, it trips us up as programmers. You want to know there's a difference but you don't want to work too hard for the difference. And, and so the seam is very, very small here. So when you look at the code, you can see, oh, this, looking at this, you're like, oh, of course, this is going to be the code I'm calling, but this is a synchronous versus asynchronous. And the way you know that is by having these kinds of cues. Oh, that's a suspend function. So that tells me that I'm going to uh, you know, have this uh, you know, called asynchronously. And as a result, my thread is not going to block on it. It's going to use a coroutine behind the scene and a continuations. So that is fairly seamless or almost seamless to the point where you don't have to work too hard for it. But more important, the structure of the code is the same. And on the other hand, by looking at it, you know that this code is not running sequentially as well. So that's a fairly good uh, difference to look at. So to summarize what we talked about, we talked about the, uh, what coroutines provide for us. Uh, one of the things that I'm more and more convinced today is that moving towards asynchrony in the Java uh, you know, JVM, we've been predominantly focusing on parallelism. But moving forward, I think we're going to be focusing more on asynchronous. And coroutines really make it easy to write asynchronous code while preserving the structure of the code between sequential versus or synchronous versus asynchronous. It's, we are able to preserve the code that removes the impedance mismatch, that really gives us the ability to uh, you know, keep a sense of what the code is doing, and, and to be able to go from uh, you, can, you can defer your decision. That's one of the biggest benefits is deferring decision. You don't have to go towards asynchrony in the beginning. You can make it sequential. When the need arises, you can very easily convert it to asynchrony. That's one of the biggest benefits you get. If you want to download the code examples I showed you, you can download it from that URL on the downloads page. Hope that was useful. Thank you.